Sheesh, it's great to see everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, this week, we read two articles from Stephen Gray Morning. Uh, I will pull them up on my computer so we can take a look. They were doing similar things as far as a reading goes. Uh, most of the readings that we've done this semester have come from uh, the Routledge book of language revitalization. And then these two documents, uh, Running the Gauntlet, comes from a text called Teaching Indigenous Languages. And then the other one is from the same text, and it's called Going Beyond Words, the Arapaho Immersion Program. So I want to talk about Flagstaff, Arizona a little bit, Northern Arizona University, and this workshop, conference, publications that are called Stabilizing Indigenous Languages. Uh, so now there's the Stabilizing Indigenous Languages Symposium. Then there was a whole series of publications in, I would say, the mid-1990s through the early 2000s from uh, these folks. So let me find something for you real quick. Uh, we're going to get rid of this stuff. And I'm going to look for So I'm going to show you folks this real quick. Has anybody seen this book before? Uh, somebody has my original copy. Somewhere I got an original copy somewhere. Uh, so this book is called Stabilizing uh, Indigenous Languages. And so this is what the cover looks like. Uh, I'm going to tell you about how I encountered this text, which was published in 1996. So I believe it was 1996 when I, that's when I started to learn the Thinget language. Uh, I spent a summer with my grandfather who was uh, sick. He had a stomach uh, ulcer that was very bad. And so I moved back to our village to be with him and to help out. While I was there, it turned out that he knew the Thinget language. Uh, well, I mean, he knew it, but I, I discovered, or I was told, that he knew Thinget by his sister, uh, Kathy Dennis. And she said, because I, I was just talking to her about the language, and and uh, she said, well, your grandpa knows it. He's kind of the one, the only one in the family that knows it really well. A lot of us can understand it, but he knows how to speak it. So I asked him to teach me the language, because I was really interested in learning. And then that fall, I went back to the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, and the... Uh, there's a publisher, a scholar named John Reiner. Oops. So his name is right here. So he was the one who started this workshop, I believe, and this publication. So his approach was people doing language revitalization didn't have a lot of avenues to publish stuff. And if you do the academic game, you have to publish things in order to sort of keep going as a professor and be promoted and that was typically especially in the 90s you had to publish in these what they call peer-reviewed journals it might be shifting a little bit now to sort of say well what if you work in indigenous languages and you just create materials there or what if you're creative and you do that you write books of poetry or you write screenplays uh, so he there was this conference called stabilizing indigenous languages and then this text is the conference proceedings, which is basically saying, would you like to write an essay that's either based on or is entirely what you said at the conference? And so uh, he had a whole bunch of these and was driving through Minneapolis, Minnesota. And he thought, well, let me just go drop a few of these boxes at their Native American Student Center. And so he did that, and I, was, I went there on a regular basis, and I happened to see the stack of books, and I grabbed one, and I started to read it. So uh, 
probably go right to the the preface and so I highly recommend reading this thing in its entirety if, if you want I mean I did I once I started reading it I didn't stop and so it started talking about languages uh, that were dying and then um, the value of Native American languages and then it you know when I got to this part and it says uh, for instance, some of us said, let's get our languages into written form, and we did, and still our Native American languages kept on dying. Then we said, let's make dictionaries for our languages, and we did, still the languages kept on dying. Then we said, let's get linguists trained in our own languages, and we did, and still the languages kept on dying. Then we said, let's train our own people to speak our languages to become linguists, and we did, and still our languages kept on dying. Then we said, let's apply for a federal bilingual education grant, and we did and got a grant, and still our languages kept on dying. Then we said, let's, let's let the schools teach the languages, and we did, and still the languages kept on dying. Then we said, let's develop culturally relevant materials, and we did, and still our languages kept on dying. Then we said, let's use the language masters to teach our languages, and we did, and still our languages kept on dying. Then we said, let's tape record the elders speaking our languages, and we did, and still our languages kept on dying. Then we said, let's videotape our elders speaking and doing cultural activities, and we did, and still our languages kept on dying. Then we said, let's put our native language speakers on CD-ROM, and we did, and still the languages kept on dying. Finally, someone will say, let's flash these, the remaining speakers of our languages, so when technology ca catches up, these speakers can be thought out and revived, and we already have ready-made Native American language speakers. And so, it kind of goes on, and, and I was really just kind of caught by some of the stuff because I hadn't read things like this before. And so this really got me into sort of thinking about Native American languages and what needs to happen in this idea of stabilizing indigenous languages. So I wrote a paper, and it was for an English class, an upper-level English class. And uh, it was called Stabilizing Indigenous Languages. And I cited several of these articles, uh, things from the preface, things from uh, a number of these different things. Bill Demert was still alive at this time, and he was a contributor. Joshua Fishman was a contributor. And so I was really, uh, and Richard Little Bear were probably the three voices that I sort of really paid a lot of attention to. And just a lot of other things that folks were already talking about in here. And so what was interesting was uh, I got like a C minus on that paper. I don't know if, you told, know if I told you folks this. But the teacher assistant who graded it wrote on there, why doesn't everybody speak English? And then just gave me a C minus. And so I fought it. I went to the dean. I went to the head of the English department. And I said, this is an act of racism. And you know, if, if they want to grade my paper, they should grade the paper based on the research and the writing, not on whether or not I'm talking about speaking English or not. And so that kind of got me fired up. And then they were a, a, a sort of a, a things that were coming together. So one was this act of racism against indigenous languages. Two was this book was about stabilizing indigenous languages. Three, learning my own, one of my indigenous languages. And then four, just sort of realizing the general state of endangerment for all indigenous languages of Native America. And so probably 20 years after that, I was invited to be a keynote speaker at the Stabilizing Indigenous Languages Symposium, which, uh, which I recommend checking out. Let's see if I can find it. I don't know what their plan is. They were going to be, well, they held it in Ontario last year. And so usually I think it goes every other year and it kind of rotates to different locations. And it's a great conference. I've been to one. The first one I went to was in Hawaii. Uh, mostly it was held at Hilo. And so I went to it there at Hilo and really got to know some of the folks in Hawaii. Uh, that's where I really met and got to know 
Kila Wilson and Larry Kamura and Kawanoi Kamana and Namaka Rollins and got invited into their PhD program. And then the next one, so I think it was probably 2014, maybe something like that. And then maybe 2016 or 17, uh, I was invited to be a speaker at the one at the Wind River Casino in Wyoming. And that is how we get to this current set of readings in the Arapaho language. So any thoughts on Mr. Gray Morning and his, his two articles here that are talking about Arapaho immersion and running the gauntlet, you know, so just sort of developing an indigenous language program. I've uh, been in a couple of lessons that were unofficial gray morning methodology with the pictures and and that uh, methodology. So honestly, I, I when I saw that there were articles by him, that's kind of what I was expecting <laughs> out of it. But one thing I really identified with was, I think it was in the second article where he, he talks about the problem, uh, getting to a problem where um, people could recite what they were taught, but they, they couldn't necessarily express themselves and i'm sort of i'm on that bridge right now with trying to figure out I, I have this i've been accumulating vocabulary from here and there and all over as much as i can for forever and now um this probably past six months or so uh especially being in this program and being exposed to the recordings and being able to take so much uh in um it, where it seems like it should be uh, uh, a little easier to express myself now. I see so many uh, different avenues and I don't want to misspeak and, and stuff like that, that it's, um, I, I, yeah, I just, I, uh, when he talks about um, the need for a, a structure because the immersion lessons that they were doing on a limited basis just kind of led to rep or like repeating back and not really thinking about what they're doing and moving it forward yeah i've i've definitely been on the on the other end of that but yeah so that's just a little thing correction a lot of language programs and folks who work in language programs talk about you know, numbers colors basic phrases counting and sort of like getting stuck kind of on those things and nothing against those things at all but i think it's it's easy to keep teaching those basic like here's here's some more nouns and here's a few more phrases and here's some more like you know here's counting people and here's counting other things and here's you know and then sometimes you get also you move from that into sort of fascination of language structures but so some of you are have gone through this or are going through this moving from the memorization phase to sort of the digestion phase to the speaking and understanding phase. What is what are going to be your approaches to making sure that folks are becoming full speakers of the language? And I'm going to bring Kuchin a microphone while you folks think of that and answer the question. I have my laptop. Please, it'll affect me. Oh, okay. Thank you. So what do you folks think? What's going to be your approach? Just, and they'll, we're learning about these methodologies as well. There's no singular sort of answer that I know of or thinking of. But just generally speaking, how are you going to bring people along so that they can't, if they see something, they can describe it. If they think of something, they can say it. And if they hear something, they can interpret it. I think they need to be able to have everything in their life in their language so when they're looking at their phone it's all in their language when they're listening to music it's in their language they're watching tv it's in their language there needs to be that 
where the language is all around them. It's not just a special block or talking with certain people um, and being able to think and dream in the language. So just having more resources and different avenues for other people. Um, like I myself, I, I don't get into the fascination of how things work and all, I just, uh, I'm like a, a kid, I, I don't think about how, I just think I need the language around me and spoken to me and read to me, um, or, you know, just like a kid. So I think there needs to be um, just more fun resources around and like, I think music's a great way because so many people can really listen to a song and before they know it in a day or two, it's, it's memorized and then that can help bring the language to other people too and then having the places on the land of course but um, just having that fluidity of the language throughout the day. Yeah while you're talking I remember uh, that this, this exists so this is uh, Wikipedia in Navajo so like um, you know stuff like this like and so and it's always i think a resource question sort of like boy like we could barely make a dictionary how you want us to make wikipedia in in our language but at the same time it's sort of like you can figure out some of these things so that you can get yourself there so you know we read in in gray morning about translating creating an a, an arapaho bambi movie uh, Hawaiian has done Finding Nemo and um, Moana. There's a there's a Hawaiian language version of Moana. And then um, I believe Navajo has done Star Wars and Finding Nemo as well, where you're actually working with the movie production company like Disney or or Pixar, which are kind of the same thing. But but then that you're actually sort of creating a language track and then it's still the whole full movie, you know, and so the, those are options in, in terms of things like that. I know there's some talk about creating uh, a Gwich'in version of Molly of Denali episodes, you know, so you take the whole episodes, you have to create special episodes. I mean, you certainly could, but you could just take existing content. I think Lakota did this with uh, Bernstein Bears. And so there's a whole series of Bernstein bears that are Lakota and they speak Lakota and they've got Lakota sounding music to it. So I, and some of these things seem like very lofty goals, I think, but I believe that if we developed one thing that should be developed at some point is an Alaska native language media network that builds up a, a group of folks that have expertise and then a few sort of people to head be project managers which are producers and so the producers would identify projects and some of them would be smaller scale things like we need to create a series of alphabet videos for uh Ununga. we need to create a series of uh, children's videos for like waking up getting ready for school in Inuka. you know and so i think some of those things could be kind of smaller scale, like five, 10, 15 minute videos. But then I think some of them could be kind of larger projects where you could be, we're gonna translate uh, this film into our language. Uh, and this is gonna be one of our big projects. I'm gonna do feature length films in these languages. And so I think there's some real potential there, but it has to be, I think, hopefully a statewide initiative so that you have a team of uh, you have some folks who can really work a camera and folks who can really do film editing and audio editing and get some folks who can really do uh, illustration and do desktop design publishing stuff. And then you've got this team and then the team has a series of projects and then probably have a board because one thing that that happens is the tug. Sometimes there's a push and pull over whose language gets to be worked on. Whereas, you know, you can try and have some equity and say, okay, we've already done three projects in Schengen, so we have to wait. We're gonna do something in Haida, we'll do something in Simshan, we'll do something in Iyak. But also to sort of work and then to, to hopefully be on this sort of growth pattern where we could say, okay, this team knows how to do this stuff. 
So they are going to work with you in your language to create this content, but we are also going to write a mini grant to get you folks some cameras and some microphones, and we're going to show you how to use this stuff while we make these things so that you can start making your own things. And we can be here to provide expertise and editing and, and all that other stuff. But I do think that's something we need to figure out because then we start developing content because uh, those teams could also strategize. If you want stuff on Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and wherever, YouTube, then put it out there because kids are on screens. I do believe that we could partner with a variety of video game companies and figure out how to do there's some games where you could just use the language that it could be the medium of communication while people are playing the game but then in others maybe the game also has its own medium its own language so other thoughts yeah Kuching. yeah well first of all um if we do make a clinket wikipedia we should call it clinkopedia <laughs> first thought but um on the reading, I, I thought it was interesting how they noticed that um, they didn't think in the school district the kids were getting enough language exposure. Yeah. And um, I'm assuming in my mind, that, you know, it says kindergarten class. So I kind of imagine that age group when Josh, Ginny, you, Paul Marks, when I was growing up, we had people come in, but it definitely wasn't once a week, maybe once a month, you know, and so we uh, weren't retaining a whole lot and um, that's just the option that you know the school district had at the time but he said here they had a immersion group for the younger kids so that even though the kids were in a situation at a certain age where they weren't getting the desired fluency mm -hmm. they just thought to teach fluency to the young kids so that by the time they were being exposed to the language when they were older Right. That was uh, less work. And so I, I, I kind of think about, you know, the language immersion places like in Yakutat and here we had some uh, uh, youth language uh, immersion classes going and kind of taking a step in that direction. And um, it's interesting to see kids uh, of such a young age next to the numbers of, you know, 600, 700 language hours, you know. Right. These kids are getting pretty crazy amounts of immersion at such a young age, and it seems like he was just able to do it. I uh, wonder how we can just do it. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, 15 minutes a day is probably not going to get you there, right? And, and so, but then as you sort of look at what he did and sort of saying, well, let's build this other program, and you're going to run into these resource questions I think all the time which was how many people do you have that can do the things and that will do the things because sometimes you have to say okay let's take what's you know like years ago I was lobbying for a Tlingit language medium school and I was really just saying the Juno school district and said we got lots of schools here in Juno take one of them and make it the Tlingit language school we'll just teach entirely in the language in the school and uh I remember at several meetings, we had a, a different superintendent than the one who's here now. And we had a meeting with that person. I just said, would you support a Tlingit language immersion school? And that person said, well, that's complicated. I was like, no, it's not complicated. I was like, it's a yes or a no. Either you do or you don't. And then um, someone else who I would say was supportive, who was on the school board, would have meetings with me and would attend every session where I would talk about this and said, well, I'm worried about two things. One is I'm worried about segregating our schools, and two, I'm worried that the amount of language that we can teach right now will be diminished. So I said, well, I think the segregation thing, like if we had a Clinket language medium school, it would be for everybody. It would be for anybody who wanted to be educated in Clinket. It's not an ethnic requirement to be Clinket to go to the school. So segregation would be by the choice of people who don't want to speak Tlingit. And I said, and as far as diminished resources, I think that's a question that capitalism continues to pose to us, which is we cannot do what's the identified normal or else we've got to come up with our own money to do it. And so capitalism already funds itself and its own systems. 
but it doesn't fund alternative systems. And so I said, well, it's, I don't see it as a one thing or the other, because you could develop, if you had a language immersion environment, then you had children who were in the other schools in the community who were learning some Tlingit, bring them to the language school once a week and have them spend a couple hours there because they'll, if it was a full language medium environment, they would learn more in those two hours than they would, uh, well, it would, it would just supplement all the stuff that they're learning anyway. So, but it was interesting and, and I feel like those conversations kind of died off just due to lack of community support and lack of support at the school district. But sort of talking about these things, it's, it's interesting to find where the middle ground is for some of these things. And to say, you know, at some point we need to be creating a base level of new speakers. And it's tough because a lot of those conversations are sort of dependent on people in the existing systems saying that they're okay with it. And this includes people who are running indigenous programs and people who are bringing in millions of dollars every year for indigenous language revitalization. So I've sat in meetings with some of these folks and I was, went on about this Tlingit medium school because I saw it work in Hawaii. I was like, let's do that then. That works. Let's do that thing. Let's do that very thing. We'll do it in our own way. But that is the thing. That's the only thing I've seen that actually works. And so then we were in some meetings and I was talking about it. And then someone that I thought was a real ally who was there said, oh, we're talking about like teaching only the language and through the language. No, we don't. We don't support that. We just want to have more of what we've got right now, which is in, in the current schools, which I know is not enough. Not to say that anybody's inadequate or doing a bad job, but it's the question of the curriculum and the structure. And it comes down to what do they get tested in? What are the standards? What keeps the school in a positive status? Which No Child Left Behind is, is not in, in existence anymore, but that was, a, that was language killing legislation as far as non-English languages. Other thoughts? Yeah, um, I mean, I thought both of these articles were excellent. And of course, it, it it's interesting to um, read articles that are reflecting on something that we're directly just kind of experiencing in, in live time and trying to make all of our own adaptations to. Um, and something that you just said, you know, the um, resources, the human resources, the human capacity um, is a challenge for us and is something that we're, you know, just trying to figure out how to navigate through. Um, it's interesting because we have, um, we have a lot of thoughts on this, but on the one hand, we definitely have people willing to want to make the leap over to focusing more of their full-time effort on learning the language or learning it better or learning to become literate in the language if they already have a base of fluency in the language. Um, and they want to contribute, but they have other full-time jobs and they can't afford to quit those jobs in order to put this focus onto our language. And so on, in that scenario, it's kind of a resource issue, financial resource issue. The other issue we have is we have um, uh, within the chato that we have, our language nest, um, varying levels of proficiency in the language and one of our strategies that we've now implemented that is really good and it kind of gets at one of the art point points that he is bringing up in one of his articles is that we um the three staff that we have we have one full-time staff teacher and then two of us that are half-time we now spend the mornings um just talking with each other in the language and asking each other basic questions like what you do last night oh this is what and then they you know they answer oh this is what i did last night what did you do last night and you know what you know hey what you know what do you what do you cook oh i cooked this or this is what we ate and so the kids are hearing us talking with each other in the language in that case oftentimes in past tense but then we also ask like hey what are you going to do tomorrow and so they're they're getting to hear kind of the the past because mostly they hear current tense present tense because that's what we're talking to them in the in the class, unless we're asking them, did you finish your food or something like that? Did you finish eating? But um, to try to expose them to a greater variation of language, but also it's really important for us as language learners because we're drilling each other on you know all these different things, and we're regularly saying like you know, do you, do you understand me? You know what I'm saying? Or one of us might have to ask somebody else or the other two like, oh, 
how do we say this in our language, you know? And so that's the only time you'll ever hear English really in the chat is if someone's asking it in the framework. We used to have them step out in the hallway <laughs> to even ask how to say a word in language, but then we realized, you know what? It's really good for these kids to hear how to say, how do we say this in our language, you know, for a word. And so all they're hearing is that single word. And um, and then the other thing technique that we're using is we're reading the some of the Gwich'in texts that are already out there. So we're now starting to like, you know, I'll read a, a paragraph handed to the other staff person. She'll read a, chap, a paragraph, then the next one will read a paragraph. And so we're also learning the language through reading these texts together and talking about what it is we're reading. But then again, the kids are hearing us reading these texts in the language, even though they're more advanced than what, where the kids level of learning are at, they're still getting to hear a lot of words. And then we're also learning. So, I mean, we're very much in that stage of, um, deepening our own knowledge of the language, supporting each other through that. And, and, but then also trying to figure out how do we, you know, bring, bring others into it. But I think that, um, it progress is definitely being made and you can hear it in our own voices and in the voices of the kids that are here. Um, but very much a lot of what he talked about it being a gauntlet <laughs> and just having to navigate so many different layers of, of, of kind of challenges. And a lot of it is just like personal emotional work um, to kind of push through the moments of feeling defeated or not being enough or, you know, questioning whether we're making progress quick enough and those sorts, all of those kind of feelings and thoughts that, that kind of weigh you down from time to time. But um, the, the group, and the last thought that I have is what I really liked in his article was his reflection on when he visited with the Maori and their week-long immersion for adults to create second language learners. And I think that's something that we're also very much, you know, we have our parents' classes, which we shifted now to online. So now we're experimenting with Zoom instruction of Gwich'in for our parents and kind of our growing team of people. And now we're kind of at the point of thinking about how do we expand it beyond just the parents in the chat to, to other people who are wanting to learn the Gwich'in language so that they could also have a virtual space that they could plug into to be learning Gwich'in as well. Um, but then also I've been thinking a lot about exactly what he wrote about, you know, because I do think we need some of those intensive immersion spaces to really advance the, the learning curve for a lot of us who are second language learners. Anyways, I know that was a lot of thoughts. But. Yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. Like, so some of the things that I would think about is one is, yeah, we're, we're going to have to sort of put the language prestige on under the sort of under our own analysis and to indigenize the process. And, and what I mean there is like, do we value the language? And then I would usually say yes, but primarily at a symbolic level. Uh, and so on a day-to-day -day basis, the majority of our people don't choose to speak the language. And also, if I wanted to become a language teacher, I'm probably going to have to work three or four jobs in order to really make ends meet and be comfortable. And I, I think as Indigenous peoples, a lot of our entities, like, it's pretty common to have a project. And let's say this project is to make some sort of language thing. For the language thing, I'm going to pay a filmmaker $300 an hour to make this film. I'm going to pay my elder $50 an hour to be a part of the film. I'm going to pay the kids in gift cards and, and so on and so forth. And then I'm going to pay the folks who are sort of translating and doing all that work, maybe $25, $35 an hour. And so what we end up saying is the skill of making films is six times as valuable as being able to speak the language. And so we could probably do, we say, okay, filmmakers three, make $300 an hour, like our elders make $300 an hour then. And if you're going to become a language teacher, we're going to figure out how to make that, you know, a teacher, it's pretty common, I think, and for a school teacher in Alaska to be making up to a six-figure salary. So I think a language teacher has to be getting near a six-figure salary, which I think some people are going to really reject. They'll probably say, well, if they love the language, they would do it. I say, well, if we love the language, we would pay just as much for someone to do this as we would other things. But there's this weird mix of 
economics and capitalism and our languages. And I feel like sometimes we, we kind of do it to ourselves where we, we maybe over humble ourselves in this area, but then we end up sending a message saying this stuff is not as valuable. Um, one thing that some folks have done is to have a language nest and then to have a language education program and then to have an adult immersion program. So for the adult immersion program, I would really recommend looking at the Mohawk adult immersion program, which is you sign up for basically a two year, you sign a two year contract where you're going to live in this place and you're going to speak the language uh, every day. And, and they do have some requirements for that, which is uh, it's not for everybody because I think if you have, as far as I know, if you have small children, and so it, it might not be for you because you need to be living there full time and, and you know, but you could certainly construct your own so that you have family learning and family living opportunities. There's other things that I've been sort of talking with folks about and brainstorming to say, well, what if the, the corporation or the tribe or whatever we're dealing with here bought a chunk of land and built a neighborhood and sold those houses to people who are committed to using the language on a daily basis. And that's worked for Gaelic to build these, build these language neighborhoods for in in Ireland. And then the other thing I was thinking of is sort of how do you tie all these things together so that you have a language movement? And that's kind of, I think, what Grey Morning is getting at a lot is like, how, how do you possibly do this when a lot of times you're fighting your own people on, on whether you should be doing this? And so for us, it, it felt like it was an awful lot and it takes so much work just to get our people to say, maybe. You know, and, and to just to get the whole buy-in that you sort of need and to sort of say, well, we want to build language nests like we see in Aotearoa and Hawaii, and we want to build an adult immersion program like we see uh, among Coast Salish and also with um, uh, Mohawk. And then we want to build some sort of thing that, that pulls all of these pieces together so that you have these intense language use environments because we can get people to say, I'm hungry, I ate, but yeah, can you get people to say, I'm hungry, but I didn't eat because I have an upset stomach. I would have eaten, but all the food was gone by the time I got there. And, and those, when you start to tie things together, it tends to get a little bit complicated. You know, and so, yeah, these are the things that I think collectively and collaboratively, we can start to figure out some workable solutions. And I'd love to meet with you folks and share some of the online techniques that we've been using and how we sort of try to reach out to folks both like at the community level classes where you got maybe 100 people on a Zoom meeting, you're trying to teach them just some basics of Tlingit and to also bring along whole groups of people and stack classes. And there, there's a few things that we found that, that are seem to be working, but it, we need to supplement those with more language use activities. Any other thoughts, folks? It's good stuff. When I, this is Wilson. I called in because I'm I'm in transit right now, but um, or I dialed in. But what I really appreciated about Green Morning's articles, especially the second one, was he didn't let death become the enemy of better. You know, he had his misgivings about how the school system was approaching language teaching, um, and he had this long vision of where he wanted um, young speakers to be. And it was a long vision and he piloted and he grew and he molded and just kept going to the next better, the next better and reevaluating, um, you know, how the students were doing and, and um, where he would go next to kind of build on, build on the approach. And I also wanted to say, I really agree with both what you and Yvonne are saying about the need for intensive, the um, adult, adult intensive, the, Inupiaq instructors and teachers in, um, in the Northwest Arctic region, many of them are second language Inupiaq learners, and um, some of them are, are further along in um, their ability to carry on a lesson in Inupiaq, but most of them are um, challenged to do even just that. And I, I get this feeling that confidence is a hard thing to keep up if you're not developing your own ability to speak Inupiaq in really um, contextual ways that, that bring your culture into the classroom and everybody's excited and it's 
everybody is lively learning and um, and I feel like the intensive approach would help our at least our teachers back home develop that not only the Inupiaq knowledge and the cultural knowledge, but also the confidence and the kind of the um, the brotherhood of it. Of uh, this work is we're all in this work together, and we're all celebrating in this intensive about this cultural activity or event together, and and then bringing that out to our um, students and communities after that. I think that that was an exciting way that um, for me that he left that article. Uh, I. I really enjoyed um, these two articles. I'll have to honestly say one of the reasons is because it was just easier reading for me than some of the Bartlett Handbook um, authors writing. It, I didn't have to read a paragraph three times over and parse it out as much as <laughs> some of the others. But um, he was an exciting um, storyteller about his own language revitalization journey. So I really appreciated these two articles together. Right. And uh, yeah, so, so thinking, you know, uh, some of the elders that I worked with, too, I, I remember they would comment, like they said, it, it's getting harder for me to speak because I just don't speak it anymore. You know, so even, uh, you know, like building these language use environments is really helpful for our elders, for ourselves, for our kids. And so to sort of like... Um, to think about that. I want us to talk for a little bit about fluency and this concept of fluency and assessment and measuring tools. And I want to share with you folks some stuff that uh, I did research on. And so there's a book called um, Saving Languages by Grenoble and Whaley, which I highly recommend. I think you can get it on, I think the whole thing's on Google Books, perhaps for free. I know through, and I always check the library too, because the library is uh, the University of Alaska Library. So I usually go to the Egan Library website. Uh, but they've done a lot of work. Like we have a professor here, Jonas Lamb, and he's done a lot of work to make sure that we have digital copies of most everything that we use to teach, as long as there's digital copies available, which is handy because uh, we can buy the books, but then it's always nice to sort of have copies of them so we could say, where did I see that thing? And you can look it up. So I went through a number of different texts and sort of reviewed what they had for measuring fluent speakers. So sort of like we saw these measurements of language health, you can also measure an individual's level of fluency. I tend to not like the term fluent, not fluent, because I think that's too basic. And I think even we have elders who are speakers but some of them can just do higher level stuff than others. And it's, it's a sensitive issue. You don't want to hurt people's feelings, but you also want to know what you have to work with. And you also want to know how to get some people to this highest level. My personal feeling is if you went into a Shingit village 300 years ago, everybody would speak the language, but you'd have this sort of common level of ability. And then you would have maybe one out of every 50 or 100 people that could do this really high level stuff, which is literature and speech making. And the language just goes through some pretty dramatic changes when you do that. So thinking of that, um, they have it in these sort of four categories. So they say non-speakers don't know the language, semi-speakers, they're limited and they have passive knowledge, highly proficient speakers means they can do a lot but they might have some gaps. They need to go ask some uh, higher level speakers. And then they have fluent speakers. So fully fluent with native knowledge of the language, they can comfortably do everything. So this is one scale, sort of a four point scale. So you get level one, two, three, four, however you want to look at them. The next one that I was looking at was uh, the Summer Institute of Linguistics Second Language Proficient proficiency estimate of vernacular speakers. So vernacular, here we come with the big words. Vernacular means day-to-day -day language. That's how I look at that term. So they have levels zero through five. So zero, unable to function in the language, um, can't really communicate. One, can do some minimum courtesy things. How are you? I'm fine. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? 
some simple face-to-face -face stuff, but couldn't really do like maybe yesterday I was hungry or you know stuff like that. Two, able to satisfy routine social demands and limited requirements in other domains. So if you went and brought the language somewhere else, they could do some things. Maybe even if they hadn't done that before, like I've never cleaned a caribou in the language, but I could, you know, if I brought my books, I could probably do quite a bit of that, but I'd have to bring the books, right? Uh, three, able to speak the language with sufficient structural accuracy and vocabulary to participate effectively in most formal and informal conversations. So I could, I could talk about just about anything and I could function and I'm pretty accurate in terms of grammar. Number four, use it fluently and accurately on all levels normally pertinent to needs. Uh, so again, like in this case, like I could take the language all over the place. And then five, uh, a hardly articulate, well-educated native speaker and reflects the cultural standards. So now I could probably do storytelling and, you know, speculate on what's going to happen and stuff like that. So that's a five point, a little bit more expanded, a little bit more detailed. Uh, then there's uh, Rubin's five degrees of fluency. Uh, so some of these come from a language called language, a book called Language Endangerment and Language Revitalization and Introduction uh, by Tasaku Tsunoda. And I highly recommend this book, although it is kind of hard to find for less than a hundred bucks. Uh, uh, there might be electronic versions of this one available though. Uh, so here, you have some titles instead of numbers, passive, symbolic, functional, fluent, creative. So under passive, able to understand common words or phrases without really getting into what that means. Just saying, oh, they're asking what my name is. Oh, they're saying um, it's time to eat. Symbolic, able to use common phrases and sentences in formal settings as symbols of language participation and cultural ownership. So I could stand up and introduce myself and say some things, but it's really, I can't really go off script. It's really, I just sort of do these scripted sort of things. Functional, able to speak the language of, with basic understanding of its syntax, grammar, and rules of usage in a minimal vocabulary. So here, like I could go to a language immersion and just, I could hang. I might not be able to say everything, but I could do an awful lot and I could function and people ask me questions, I can answer them. Fluent, able to understand and speak the language with confidence and skill, with understanding of normal syntax, grammar, and rules of form, and an extensive and growing vocabulary. So here, as I could participate in discussions on a wide variety of topics, I could initiate conversations. I could sort of really jump in and just respond quickly and not have to think too hard or look stuff up. And then creative, so also looking at sort of new usages and structures like if someone says hey what's the word for this thing like well i don't think we have a word for that but we can make one up or we could talk about what that thing is and then also sort of uh potential uses and creativity i think is important here and i would add speculation and imagination if you can do those things in your language then you're really taking it pretty far i think so then that gets us to the ACTFL scale, uh, so that's the American Council of Teachers of Foreign Languages, and they have uh, these five sort of labels, novice, intermediate, advanced, superior, distinguished. So novice, you can communicate, everything's just memorized. If it's not a memorized thing, can't really do it. Intermediate is you can create, and then you can ask and answer simple questions, and you could deal with the simple situation or transaction. Uh, for example, there was a there was an intermediate speaker that used to work at Safeway here in Juneau, and I used to always go in that person's uh, lane, even if the line was longer, because I wanted to do my, I could do my whole transaction and think it, and that was really fun for me. Uh, advanced can narrate and describe in all major time frames and handle situations with complications. So if you, could you say, I went to the store yesterday, but they're all out of eggs. Since they're out of eggs, I bought a gallon of milk or, or whatever the thing, you know, especially if it starts to get pretty complicated to say like, well, when the milk spilled, it went into the, you know, whatever, I don't know, 
um, superior can support opinion, hypothesize, discuss topics concretely and abstractly, and handle a linguistically unfamiliar situation. For example, if your kid says, what happens when people die? Could, could you tell them in the language what your theories are, what other people think, and how to encourage them to think about it themselves, or whatever thing you want to teach them? And then distinguished uh, global issues, highly abstract concepts, hypothetical discourse, and you know, specific to audiences. For for Tlinga, this is the big stories, the big speeches. This it requires very advanced gram grammar things that are going on. So with all of that, is there one of these that you tend to lean towards, or are there things that you would want to take from particular ones? Um, I would say what comes to mind for me, um, I don't like you, um, the, the term fluency with indigenous languages, that's kind of hard to apply. Um, I like the idea of, you know, like, like you're saying, people in their different niches and skills have language for that. Um, I was fortunate, uh, we had a weaving class with, um, with, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, but we also had Paul Marx and Grandma Gay's, I can't remember her English name, huh? but um, we had Paul Marx there, and with his knowledge of fishing and seining, he was able to talk about how to tie knots in clinket. Um, the phrase was handiwork, gin something, and then Grandma Gaze was talking about TV and her dad's interpretation of a TV, which was a claim in, 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 in his mind. So, and she was talking about working at the smokehouse and, you know, just her end of that process of the uh, processing fish. And Paul was talking about being on the boat. And it was really great to see those two um, really similar levels of language. And you'd see one not quite know what to say and the other get really, really excited just because it was, you know, part of them, part of their way of life, part of what they had done growing up. And it was uh, easy to talk about. So, yeah, um, not not looking at that black and white fluency and letting our ways of life be our, the ways of that we speak, you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's cheesh. It's cheesh. And there's a reality here with endangered languages that you might have to reconstruct certain things like your people might have been weaving since forever and might have been cleaning moose or, or whatever forever, but you might have to reconstruct particular scenarios. And I think getting enough folks to, to these higher levels of fluency, and I think fluent is the word to sort of tire, but I think fluency is a scale. It's sort of like, and I think it's up to the language community to determine what that scale is, how to measure it, how to encourage folks to continue. And I think what a language movement should do is just celebrate improved proficiency. Really make a big deal about it. We don't do that yet, but we're, we're in talks about how, how we should do that. Uh, I think Depending on how your people are, I, I think status is a nice thing. Get a certain jacket that people get or some sort of design that they can use. I think, um, and it's not excluding other people to do this. I think this is another thing that sometimes I do get some pushback on is to celebrate the achievements of those doing it is not taking away from anybody who's not, but is saying, Hey, everybody, come do this thing so you can get these great things as well. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think it's really helpful to have frameworks to kind of, you know, as, as you were reading through these, I was kind of evaluating, like, where our three staff are, <laughs> you know, based on these different varying scales. And I think it's, I think it's nice to have language being able to determine or define you know, where we're really at in our learning journey. Um, I don't know if any of these, these are all 
focused on speaking though, not necessarily literacy, it looks like. Um, and, and, oh, go ahead. Yeah, and but and so anyway, so I, I mean, I, I mean, I think that the the more detailed ones are more useful, like the the actful and the ones that have the scales of zero to five, because they give you a little bit more gradient. Mm -hmm. And also, I use proficiency as the word that I use a lot, like levels of proficiency that that we that we have that we're working towards, and um, and and so yeah, that's. You know, and I really think a lot of this makes a lot of sense where when you begin making that shift um, from, you know, as it kind of articulated, and I think a few of these from kind of, and as the article is alluded to where this, the kids were only able to speak to what they were specifically being taught versus um, generating unique thought or being able to respond to questions that are in the different frameworks of time and um, and then action, you know, um, and and levels of description. I would say, um, you know, asking, you know, uh, and with us, I guess, who are adult second language learners, getting to a point of being able to say, hey, you know, well, how 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 do you say, you know, uh, tomorrow I'm going to put on some really fancy clothes that don't have any tears in them, you know, and. And then they then that person you know responds and then says okay well then how do you say you know your your pants that you're wearing yesterday the pants I was wearing yesterday were really dirty you know, or whatever and you're just kind of giving each other these scenarios that challenge you to have to think through and um, basically doing translation work essentially from English into in in, the, in our case Quechen but anyways I think these are helpful but you also mentioned I thought that that you all had developed this uh, a framework for assessing people's levels of proficiency in Tlingit, if I remember correctly, but that's something I'm also really interested in hearing about. Yeah, and I really love your idea of having your speakers and your learners challenge each other with sort of difficult and sometimes funny things to say, right? Um, whatever you brought to work yesterday to eat was stinky, you know, or just something, just something that could be kind of fun, but as long as we're not, I guess we might end up insulting each other, but we can have fun with this kind of stuff too. And so you could develop, and Actful has, they have other scales for literacy, they have other scales for, you know, uh, and you can certainly develop your literacy scales, especially as you build a language medium school program. You're going to have to develop a whole bunch of stuff in terms of your content assessments. And I want to say like this, these methods work for second language learners. And you could develop your own scales for birth speakers as well. Because one of the things that I think your language program should do is figure out how can we help with the fluency of, because we there's lots of people who know Tlingit but just have a hard time speaking it for whatever reason. And running them through the whole series of our six semester sequence of Tlingit is, is not the most effective way and we haven't found the most effective way yet. Uh, we did, so, uh, and this is from uh, the, my dissertation, which I'm happy to, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but I'm happy to share that with you as far as a, a link to what it is. And so I did take this stuff and developed a 10 point scale that we basically use. And I've made some adjustments to it since then. And I'll share that document with you folks um, in the next class. I'll get, I'll get it ready for you so you folks can see it. But just sort of giving us a, a more a benchmark that's more based in our the specifics of our language and our culture. So you have a beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and within each of those you have low, mid, and high. And then there's some basic things like low, you, you can't really do anything. Mid, you can you know about a hundred different phrases and about 160 nouns, uh, and then you know. Hi, you know, uh, almost 500 different phrases and 300 nouns. You can introduce yourself. You can substitute nouns in a whole bunch of phrases. I want this. I want that. I like this. I like that. My mom likes this. But they're all just very sort of basic level sort of things. At the intermediate level, you're starting to move beyond memorization to construction of the language. And you can also understand when you listen to the language, you could understand generally what people are talking about, but you couldn't tell people what they were saying. 
as you go higher, you're getting into verbs and starting to move them for time. You're starting to be able to move the pronouns away around to say, I did it, you did it, they did it. Uh, you can repeat things, so you usually don't have to hear things more than a couple times before you've got the structure of it. And you can follow conversations really well, although you might have a hard time translating what is actually being said. For intermediate high, uh, now, you're, now we start to get into some specifics about happened or is that, was that way, uh, is happening, is that way, will happen, will be that way. You can talk about kinship and clans and, and those types of structures. You can follow long stretches of thinget uh, and you can respond to things when needed and possibly even give a, a formal cultural response to something that somebody said. And then you can give short speeches about things or tell little stories. For the high level, uh, it, it really starts to move into like more complicated things, being able to move them around, being able to speak for long periods of time, uh, which would include like if someone just sat down and said, uh, tell me about how you watch the weather and whether or not you're going to go out in your boat. And then, you know, or just something, it could just be something you haven't had time to prepare for it. People just ask about it. Tell me the difference between uh, a caribou and a deer, you know, just, just stuff like that. Uh, and then you can listen to very long stretches of the language at high levels without really needing to translate it. You can introduce other people and talk about them and, and give, you can use short narratives. At the intermediate, you can start to talk about global things and local things. Like I could tell you, uh, you know, the power went out the other day because this big storm. I could talk about that stuff. And then, uh, Basketball tournaments are coming up, and I can tell you about that stuff. And uh, start to get into doubt, uncertainty, theorizing things, uh, using our thinket knowledge. Uh, you can start to get into some of these habitual and more conditional type of forms, understand pretty much everything. And then we get up to, huh, and then we can't measure you beyond this. And so what we've developed when we first started doing language assessments, it was kind of getting this these panel of elders to sit down and have a conversation with you. Uh, but it's kind of shifted over time because I think having four elders sit there and talk to you, I think is actually really a high pressure thing. And so we usually just do this as a one-on-one -on -one conversation now with kind of a scripted thing. At the beginning, uh, it's just some pretty simple phrases and then it's asking you to do some pretty simple list building things. And then for intermediate, the phrases start to get more complex and it's starting to ask you to talk about some things in some longer, like str stringing some things together. And then when you get to advanced, usually they're more complicated questions and uh, there's usually one long stretch from a speaker, um, from some recording or something that's been translated and transcribed and you're asked to translate a pretty intense chunk of the language. And then you're asked to do some things that are a bit more complicated and usually like, tell me about a current event, uh, tell me something that you think is gonna happen in the next five years, and, and just stuff like that, that tries to get sort of a little bit less of memorized things that you can do and a little bit more to sort of an unusual kind of area. But that's, that's what we do. I think the interview takes about an hour. It was developed uh, with the Yakutat Tlingit tribe, working with some of their speakers and also with their learners and their language team. And then sort of it's continually going through refinement, but it gives us a pretty good idea, I think, of where folks are at. And then it also, the missing element for, from my perspective is celebrating when folks go to, they go up a level, like they, they should be like a, at the very least the, the sound when, when Mario eats the mushroom or, or something, right? There, there should be something um, at the community level, I think that's really acknowledging and showering praises and gifts upon people. Any other thoughts? And I'm happy to share all this information with you folks and take it and run with it, to make it your own, you know? I have another question. Um, 
you know, just on my learning journey, um, running up against linguistic terms, <laughs> perfective, I saw it in some of your writing there, perfective, you know, imperfective, optative, like all, all these linguistic words, I feel like I've slowly am kind of grasping pieces of from time to time. But I, I was thinking, is there an indigenous person or somebody who's written like a, a book that just gives you the, the basis of linguistic terminology that you see showing up in different texts and 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 in some of the linguistic research, at least for on our language, that if I'm if I'm, if I'm digging around in the archives, for example, at the university, I'll. So I don't know. So that's a question. Is there like a a, a guide or a textbook that's really succinct that gets to the point on kind of ling the linguistic terminology that's helpful to know? Yeah, that's a really good question. Like, so we we've had uh, in Tlingit, we had someone who went and his name is James Crippen and and. He's Tlingit by birth and uh, became a, he got his PhD and his master's at both in linguistics. And so he's been really helpful to sort of continue to for, sort of figure out some of the finer points of the language. And then my role and, and a few others, like our role is to sort of take his work and the work of the other, other folks who do linguistics and say, okay, this is not going to be, you know, some of this is not going to be helpful. It's gonna be helpful for those of us who love to geek out on the language and figure out a whole bunch of stuff. But some of the terms, and, and this is something I think the Mohawk have done, and this is something we should have some workshops and conversations on is how do you indigenize this process of documenting how your language works? I think phase one is to have someone in the language who's, who's studying, who's active, who's using it, who understands a lot of things in terms of the language belongs to the people forever uh, to document how the language works and then to work with the language teachers to say which one of these terms do we need to adjust because we're not trying to a lot of the terms function really well for the community of linguistics to say oh yeah this is one of these things oh yeah this is these but then sometimes it's like you just end up talking about like these big terms rather than sort of focusing on what is going on in the language. So for for us, we do use perfective because it's not really a, it's not a time marker, it's an event marker, but then we got to sort of talk our way through those things. And as you sort of develop whatever, we, we kind of focus on a six semester sequence going beginning one, two, intermediate one, two, advanced one, two, and then in advance, we have people who are taking it over and over and over because it, it's just such a, it's rare to find a place where you can use the language on such a regular basis. And also to continue to sort of examine those things, this sort of in-between area between using the language, hearing it, speaking it, and then studying it and trying to figure out like how to get these things into your mind. I do believe like there's quite a few languages who sort of said, okay, here's what these things are. Well, we're just going to come up with our own terms for them. And I know in, in Hawaii, they, they do all of their grammar and stuff in Hawaiian. So one of the things that you could do is to indigenize the whole process by saying, okay, we here are these things and we, we know what they do, we know what they are. So we will give them names in our own language. But uh, yeah, I think a series of workshops would help. Um, I figured out a few things, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that I haven't figured out yet. Victoria? Oh, yeah. I wanted to say that um, Miriam Ignacius, I think that's her name, my teacher in, um, at SFU, she created a First Nations curriculum guide book with the actual and all that other stuff for the nations over there to, to get funded for their languages. So I think that's a good resource. The other thing, um, Going back to the elders, um, Athley Dow, Terry Burr, she learned from three different elders. So they all had their strong points on um, what they would teach her. Like John Reese, he was a fisherman and a hunter. And then Gertie Johnson, she, um, her father was a preacher. So she got a lot, everybody brought her a lot of the food where she didn't have to go out and get it. So each elder had their own um, different aspects what they brought to the language and I think the last thing that I wanted to talk about was yeah, sorry my son <laughs> um 
when she did assessments on me, I think at one point I started off with like a half an hour and I was able to say like one or two word sentences. And then after like, um, we did this like every year, sometimes twice a year. And then my assessments just kept on getting longer and longer to where they were like over an hour and you had to come back and finish the assessment. And each of these are um, videoed where we can go back and look. So at one of them, I had like pink hair and I couldn't like speak out. <laughs> so it was, it was a real improvement when um, our last assessment, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I'd love to see that work by um, Marianne, if you, if you can share it with me. That'd be great. Oh yeah, yeah, you can look that up. Any other thoughts, folks? So another thing that we were sort of talking about, it's been a while since I've sort of taken a look at this thing, but we're having conversations in Hawaii about uh, indigenous domains and use, and then uh, just trying to figure out some things about cultural use and language use. Because sometimes the places where the culture is prevalent is not the same place where the language is prevalent. And so sometimes if you're going to bring the language into all these different places, you got to sort of have these strategies. And so we started to sort of talk through this stuff um, and some of the things that we were sort of determining or, or wondering perhaps is the best word is to get the indigenous realm to privilege the indigenous language which is sometimes a real challenge, right? It is a real challenge because sometimes you might have folks who are very culturally knowledgeable, but they, they don't know the language. Like they know how to fish, they know how to hunt, they know how to, they know how the culture works and what you're supposed to do in particular cultural scenarios, but they might not know the language. And then they might also sometimes be a little bit threatened when the language comes in um, or be a little bit uh, disoriented. Some of the things we also were talking about is that sometimes uh, the I'm trying to move my little zoom thing in here. Sometimes the colonial language sphere seems more cultural than the area that exclusively uses the target language. So those things become kind of interesting because you create these environments where the language is used, and then sort of like they, they just become these kind of different areas, maybe a little bit scholarly, maybe a little bit sort of uh, if you have a language nest, the stuff that you're talking about on a day-to-day -day basis might be kind of different, but similar to other things. And so in, in Hawaii, a lot of what they do is they say, make your school a home where the language is, the indigenous language is the primary language. The other things is sometimes you're focusing on indigenous culture and sometimes you're focusing on the entire society. So if you'd like your language to be all over the place, and sometimes you're, you're doing some work that does that. You're working with public radio or you're working with uh, developing media content. And sometimes you're just sort of looking at how do we sort of get our people to choose this language. And so thinking about this stuff like the colonial domains and then uh, the indigenous domains. And so, for example, some places where the language and the culture are there. You want indigenous homes. You want the language to be there uh, on a regular basis. You might have language centers. Like in, in an ideal universe, I think every one of our communities would have a place where the language lives and people can go there to learn it, speak it, use it. And it's it would serve the meet the needs of our community. And it would also be a physical place where I know once I go there, like I got to leave my English on the doorstep. Uh, language program offices, perhaps, uh, private industry, maybe, maybe not, probably not, uh, public schools, public spaces, uh, sacred locations, and then cultural centers. And so trying to sort of balance like this idea of just because the culture is there doesn't mean the language is there, and just because the language is there doesn't mean the culture is there. And just trying to be strategic about some of this stuff, because if you want people to speak the language uh, at a non-indigenous domain, you have to have a different approach because sometimes you're trying to sort of get people to do that. Like, could you get people to to order coffee or something at the local coffee shop 
in the language? Could you get that place to move into the language for 30 minutes of the day and say, we'll bring a bunch of people there who love the language and who are going to do stuff. And that takes a different level of strategies than saying, oh, we're going to make sure that the tribal office or the Angsa Corporation office spends one hour a day in the language. Like that's going to be a different sort of strategy and approach. And you're going to find resistance to, to all of these things. So like these are just some things that, that I was also talking a lot, and especially with Pila, we, we talk about this stuff quite a bit. And sometimes strategizing which domains are you going to reclaim first. And it might not be a full reclamation, like we'll never speak English in this spot again. But it sort of just means, yes, the indigenous language lives here as well. So good stuff, folks. We have TPRS on Wednesday. If you're on the TPRS presentation committee, be prepared. And if you haven't signed up for a spot to present, let me know and I can show you where the where the spreadsheet is and make sure that you're signed up. You're just leading a discussion. You're going to sort of uh, probably prepare some slides. You're going to tell us what this thing is, where it comes from, how it's used, what are some of its limitations. And you're you're just presenting a, a dive into into this content so that your colleagues here have it in their toolbox. And go ahead and go find out some stuff on TPRS, even if you're not presenting, so you can be part of an informed member of a discussion on Wednesday about what is it, teaching proficiency through reading and storytelling. I think that's what TPRS stands for. Okay, any questions? Have a great day, folks. See you on Wednesday. We're going direction. Finish change. Sheesh.